Good evening, or morning, or afternoon, <laughs> wherever you are today. <laughs> um, welcome to our live stream. Um, I'm Sarah Z Haskett, and I'm joined with Margot Escott today. Um, and we're going to be talking about improv and how improv can help our mental well-being. And in particular, Margot's work with Parkinson's, with people who are suffering from, from Parkinson's disease, um, because it's really, really fascinating. So um, I met Margot um, at a workshop uh, done by Christine Kruger, um, who wrote an incredible paper, one of the first uh, sort of papers on improv and wellness. And we had a great time, didn't we? It was a really cool it workshop. Wonderful. Oh, it was a great class, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was so good. And it was so great to like meet other people across the world and, you know, so um, sort of link up with people who are trying to do the similar things. Um, and, and when you spoke about your work with Parkinson's, it just fascinated me. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm really, really keen to hear about that. But first of all, do you want to sort of introduce yourself a little bit? Um, I'm happy to. Uh, my name is Margot Escott. I received an MSW at New York University many decades ago. <laughs> I practiced in Naples, Florida for over 30 years. And um, I've always been interested in experiential type of therapies, whether it was art or music or drama. And oh, I guess about 20, 25 years ago, I started teaching something called New Games to other social workers and to the general public. And New Games were created back in the 70s and they were win-win games for all populations. And okay. interestingly enough, they were very similar to what I picked up 10 years ago when I started studying improvisational theater. Um, oh. I live in Naples, Florida. I have a little dog that might be here at some point. Um, and I'm just so delighted to be here. And that's, that class was great. And that was part of, it was a spinoff from the movie Act Social by Sean Mulville. And that's how we came to meet each other. So it was, it was just terrific. And um, I love being a social worker because as I was mentioning before the show, I've worked in so many different settings like hospice or dialysis or home health. But basically I've been in a private practice for many years now as well. And that's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> do we get the dog on as well? <laughs> Can the dog do improv? <laughs> <laughs> she improvises all the time. She's very cool. <laughs> yeah, dogs are good at that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's cool. So, so, so you studied theatre. Was that before you were studying um, as so in social work? Well, actually, I didn't study theatre. New games were really used by recreational therapists, and, oh. and before I even got my MSW, I was pursuing dance therapy. I was looking at becoming a dance therapist but my knees couldn't withstand it. And mm -hmm. I was doing volunteer work at an outpatient, we call it the deinstitutionalization de -institutionalization movement in the US when large uh, psychiatric facilities were being closed down because they were horrible. Um, mm -hmm. Ron era had done exposés and I'm sure you had some of the same thing in the UK. Um, Actually, it was at Bedlam where people used to pay admission to go and see the so-called lunatics, I believe, uh, if I know my history. Mm -hmm. But terrible conditions that the mentally ill were facing in the U.S. So they started deinstitutionalizing them and discharging them to communities where they had community mental health centers. So I worked at one of those and volunteered in the 70s in uh, New York State. Okay. And I was volunteering and I had been studying uh, dance therapy for a while. So I came in and I was doing some kind of movement therapy with patients, many of whom had been on, you know, the insulin treatment, the electric shock treatment. Mm -hmm. And the recreational therapist told me about something called New Games. It was a three day training and I could become a referee in New Games. And so I did it. And when I became an MSW, I started teaching these games, which were similar to improv because they had people become aware of themselves and working right. successfully in a group. So I didn't really study theater. 
But I got into improv about 10 years ago, and I got in <laughs> and jumped in with both feet. And I've been <laughs> studying. I studied acting. I studied musical improv, and um, improvisation is just something that I just love today. And yeah. uh, so, if you want, I can tell you about how I got into improv for Parkinson's. Mm. Yes, do because I'm really interested. Like, how did that happen? You know, what? Well, <laughs> who? How did that connection happen between doing improv? and how you could help people with Parkinson's. Cause I feel like that's really innovative. You know, it's so, it, it's so creative. It's so new. It, it's not something I've heard of before. Well, uh, there's a bit of history behind it. In 1998, my father, Ivan S. Scott, who had been a captain with Pan Am Airlines when they were still in existence, was diagnosed with Parkinson's. That very same week, I was invited to come to the very first meeting in Naples, Florida for a organization called Parkinson's Association of Southwest Florida. Okay. I mean, talk about serendipity. So they asked me, I, I was known for speaking on humor and play and new games. That's what I did a lot, Sp spoke on humor, play and laughter. They invited me to do a little talk. My dad was diagnosed. We immediately got involved in the agency, which I'm still involved with today, and my dad, for several years was very active. He was on the board, he went to all the meetings, and unfortunately, um, he passed away in 2007. And at that time, he had been diagnosed with Lewy body disease, which I'm sure you're familiar mm -hmm. with. Yeah. Which is, is a pretty severe form of Parkinson's with delusions and hallucinations. So for the last mm -hmm. five years of his life, because I'm a social worker and I know what some of the homes are like for people. My husband and I cared for him in his home. And mm -hmm. so um, it was a beautiful experience. Um, so he passed away in 2007 and it wasn't really until 2011 that I discovered improv. Okay. And when I started taking improv, I immediately saw the therapeutic value and I thought, oh wow, I could be a pioneer in this. And then I did some research and I connected with Kristen. <laughs> Kruger, oh. who's been an amazing mentor to me, an amazing friend to me. And I started developing courses for improv for anxiety and working with kids on the spectrum. Um, and then I started thinking about people with Parkinson's. Mm. That's Excuse amazing. Me. So, yeah. So, so you knew Christine um, before, way oh, before yeah. the workshop that we yes. did. Okay. Because she was one of my early uh, podcasts, and I was so excited when I met her. And actually, when I started the podcast, Improv Interviews, it was with people like herself and other therapists, psychologists who were starting to use improv. Um, mm -hmm. In the UK, I've entered Nathan Keats. I'm not sure if you know who Nathan is, but he's a yeah. person. Um, and other people from the UK as well. So um, over four years ago, I started thinking about using improv with people with PD um, and their care partners, because I knew people with PD, of course, mm. and I knew what it was like to be a care partner and what those, some of those issues were. So uh, at first I went around to a lot of the assisted living facilities and independent living facilities offering to work with their patients um, of any capacity. And they didn't know what improv theater was. They thought it was whose line is it anyway. I could literally not get my foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And then finally I started thinking about the fact that I was a volunteer with the Parkinson's Association. So I approached them and of course it was gonna be a free class. And we started at uh, the building they had at that time. And then eventually we moved to a local theater um, and then with the pandemic, we've been on Zoom ever since the pandemic. And I actually have students who have been with me the whole time, four years. So um, we meet once a week on a Saturday morning, which is afternoon in your time. And um, we, it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience. I've seen people grow and change. We've lost some of our beloved members as well. That does happen. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it's my favorite time of the week. No, oh, that's that's really cool. That's really cool. So, so you just kind of 
you just kind of put these ideas together and then you, you were seeking out how you could start it. So I've got this really annoying fly. If I'm just like crazy flicking my hands, it's because a fly is attacking me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, it's <laughs> because I, I, I get the connection between doing improv, for like anxiety and depression. You know, we, we know that laughing is good for us just generally. So it makes sense, you know, messing around, playing improv games, gonna help us feel better in our mood. Um, but it, it, I just, it's so interesting to see how that can be expanded. Yes. How I was, set group. I was just thinking of an example. One of yeah. the characteristics of Parkinson's is facial rigidity. They have a mask like expression mm. so in the beginning of our classes we do one or two things right away we do show don't tell your emotions <laughs> and we do a range of emotions so then i might put up a feeling wheel and say okay let's pick an emotion from the feeling wheel now nice but, and the other thing we do right away is I've been doing, I love musical improv, but sometimes it's a little bit difficult for them. And it doesn't have to mm -hmm. rhyme, you have to have a great voice. And they do great musicals when they're doing gibberish, um, but they haven't been able to quite adapt to backing tracks. But what they do love is I'll put on a musical a karaoke song and mm -hmm. I'll put the full screen with the words on it. So for example, we did some Hank Williams the other day um, hey, good looking. Um, <laughs> what do you This land is your land. The average age of the students is about 78, um, right. 86. We do have some younger folks as well, but mostly um, about all those ages. And singing is so great for people with Parkinson's. It's mm. not truly really an improv game as such, but it helps them uh, use their voice and um smile a lot and laugh a lot we know music is so good some of the exercise also that we use include vocal exercises and i use the phrase which comes from viola spolin share your voice nice so share your voice and have them to speak a little bit louder um <laughs> so we also play we play a lot of games that involve movement with object work and gestures because some mm. people who are confined to a wheelchair just kind of sit around all day mm. and not really moving. So we like to play games that have people moving. We've even played a game called Zip Zap Zop um, with our Parkinsonians. And we do scene games um, and we've actually do story spine. I have, oh, here they are. I made up the, uh, are you familiar with the game story spine? Um, I'm not sure about that one, actually. Okay. Well, it starts off like this. Ah, uh, yes. And then the next one says every day until one day. And each person gets a, a strip to say part of the story. And this they, they played this when we were in real time, when I'd pass around the laminated strip. So we play this now on Zoom. And they're great at it. They love that game. <laughs> They also like gibberish. And, you know, some of the people have difficulty speaking. Hmm. Their, their speech is slow. And with some also with dementia, we have some varying stages of dementia. They may have word retrieval problems. Yeah. So the fact that there are no mistakes, which is improv philosophy, and that we take all the time you need is very important so people won't feel embarrassed. Now, what's interesting, a lot of times the care partner will be on screen and they're all invited, of course, and they'll be on screen with the person with Parkinson's. Well, sometimes the spouse who's the caregiver wants to tell their partner what, do it this way or say this. And so I have to constantly say, I am the director of this group. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know when you start talking about it, it just makes so much sense. It just makes so much sense. But I would have never have made those connections. Um, but then when you talk about it, yeah, it it really does. Like I can see how how each one of those techniques, each one of those games, those those things that you're doing are are helping someone. 
there's, there is a therapeutic aspect yes. to this. Yes. And of course, connecting as a group, being validated by others mm. having the same feelings. Yeah. And knowing they're not alone. And actually, um, since the pandemic has somewhat lifted here and before the pandemic, they go out to lunch together. They meet Aww. each other somewhere, go for a cup of coffee without me there. Um, mm -hmm. And so they formed a really tight group, which is so beautiful to see. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how did you find it adapting those games online? Was that a challenge at first or? You know, I'll tell you what, Sarah, it really wasn't because several mm -hmm. years ago, because I'm in Naples, Florida, there's not a lot of improv classes I can teach. I mean, I can take rather. Um, and we would have a festival uh, 100 miles away here once a year, but that was kind of it. So several years ago, before the pandemic, I was studying with people on Skype. So for example, okay. a gentleman named Gary Schwartz, who was a student of Viola Spolin's. Mm -hmm. And I studied with somebody named Dave Rosowski, who was with the second- Oh yeah, I've done a really great workshop with him. He's great. He's a yeah. lot of fun. So I was already used to using the medium. So it came pretty, I guess it came pretty naturally to me. And, you know, occasionally we would have tech issues, but um, they've been solvable. And are you accepting people from outside of Florida for yeah. your improv sessions with Parkinson's or? or is oh, yes, I am. Yeah. In fact, I'd really like to start another group during the week. Okay. Um, with, because our group has, we have anywhere between 10 and 14 members right now. Now, not everybody's able to come every week, but uh, but some of our members do want to have a weekday meeting. So I'd be very open to that if enough people wanted it. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so if anyone's watching and um, you know someone who is who has Parkinson's and is keen to get involved in something a bit different that has huge beneficial factors um yeah get in touch just drop us a little i've put your website actually in the in the um comment section of this video so you can hook up with margot um by following that link to her website that's yeah no it's it, it's so brilliant and and something that i think you know we, we should see more of but i suppose um you know i suppose it takes a very special set of skills to be delivering these types of workshops, given that you know you've got your um, creative background, um, you know improv, dance, um, and and your mental health background as well. So it's so it's one of those types of things that you know not everyone could just pick up and do. <laughs> well, and I've, got my, I've got my play and humor background too. So all these different paths we know that we, we don't often see when it's happening, mm -hmm. what this training or skill will do, but they kind of all come together in, in improv, I think. Yeah, yeah, how they all link together and you can just make something fabulous with it. Yeah, yeah, really. It's so, so great to be here and talk with you and speak with you today. Um, I'm also doing more work with people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And okay separate group, uh, separate skill sets. Again, the music and the movement is very important and the repetition. Mm -hmm. And so various populations are benefiting from improv. And it's it's global now, we know as well. I uh, taught some little girls in India recently. Which oh, really? Lovely, yeah. Wow, that's really cool. And you've been doing quite a lot of teaching um, workshops, haven't you, recently? Because I noticed on your website you've got um, you've got a link for a few different classes and I, and you did one for the act social website, which was, um, the people who hosted, uh, the yeah. workshop that we met on. Um, and so how's all that going? How are you finding it? It's going great. Um, I'm on a kind of a lull right now. I'm going to be starting my improv for wellness classes up fairly soon. And I'm working with a fellow named Dr. Dan Weiner, who is a PhD psychologist who over 30 years ago wrote a book called Rehearsals for Growth, which is actually the first clinical book on using improv. Mm -hmm. And I've been working with him and we're gonna be presenting a workshop in the summer on Rehearsal for Growth Method, which is just brilliant. So I'm excited nice. about that. 
I'm excited about the possibility of starting another Parkinson class as well as my improv for anxiety class. So I'm taking a bit of a break and then gearing up for August and September. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. We've got to take a bit of a break sometimes, haven't we? But yes. it sounds like you're coming back in with a boom there and you've got loads of things. You're like making waves everywhere. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, it's great fun. And I, I also perform. I perform with a group called um, the Vintage Improv, and it's a great group. And it's for vintage people who are over the age of 50. And we okay. perform um, the second Sunday of every month. Uh, and uh, some other teams as well. And it's just improv has really changed my life. I feel mm -hmm. healthier because of improv myself. Mm -hmm. Excited about the possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm noticing there's a few people watching the stream. So if anyone has any questions or anything that you want to ask, just pop it in the chat. Um, and, and I'm sure, you know, we can, we can bring that up and we can put it out on the table and ask those questions. So yeah, put anything in the chat that you want to. And, and it's, it's interesting what you just said there about, you know, how improv just kind of opens things up and how you feel better. I, I felt, I found improv, only really when the pandemic happened. Um, so before that I was very much into more um, kind of straight theater, like um, forum theater stuff, which uh, the, the theater of the oppressed. Um, yes, so, well, uh, wonderful. Work. Yes, 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 yes. And I was really, uh, I've been very much involved in theater for social change. And when I found improv, it kind of felt like it was the missing ingredient, you know? It was the little bit, the the sparkle. It was the sparkle that kind of fitted all the holes. <laughs> yeah. So so tell me more about your work with, um, you know, with the socially oppressed and with Boel. What kind of groups have you been doing or workshops or... So, um, yes, so, so nothing particularly recently because I haven't been able to convert it very well online. I don't know if anyone else is doing um, Forum Theatre online. And if you are, you know, hook me up and tell me how you're doing it. Give me a lesson. Um, but I, I found it quite hard to convert during the pandemic. But p before the pandemic, um, I did a lot of like image theatre work where we were showing expressions and run looks threading a story through some um, some sort of uh, autobiographical photography involved in that as well, yes, um, yeah. which was quite an interesting project. And then um, just kind of the more uh, sort of street theatre style, the traditional forum theatre stuff where we just go out and get people involved on the street, you know, or in a workshop, in a, in a, in a show. Oh, that is so brilliant. Now, have you worked at all with playback theatre? I know of playback theatre. I haven't worked with them, um, but I, I did do a training course with um, Cardboard Citizens, with Adrian Jackson, Cardboard Citizens, yeah, and I had a great time. Oh, that's wonderful, because that's very relevant to, I think, therapy and social work as well. Mm. Yes, I've, I've, I've heard of them. I think I follow someone on Instagram from there. Yeah, there's a few different... Um, places that have popped up over the last few years and it's definitely becoming more of a more of a thing you know more of a yeah, thing well, I mentioned, want a better word yeah, I've got friends in India who are doing playback theater and doing great work with it um, so um, I wondered if we had any questions because I I can also talk about some of the other games we play in improv with Parkinson's and movement disorders and I can I, I include movement disorders because there's a million people in our country with Parkinson's. I'm not sure what the figures are in yours. Typically, it's a over 60-year-old male, um, but women get it too. And we, of course, have early onset, like with um, mm. Michael J. Fox and others. Yes. Uh, but um, when yeah. we're in real time, we like to play a game called Zip, Zap, Zop. And I'm sure you've played that game, Zip, yeah. Zap, Zop. It's, it's a little difficult to play on... Uh, Zoom, but how we adapt it is by saying Claire, Zip, Bob, Zap, you know, so right. add their names to it so it makes it somewhat easier. And um, in our groups, if anybody feels they've made a mistake, if they say Zip instead of Zap, they all go, ta-da! 
so we, we celebrate what could be seen as mistakes or failures, and that's a lot of fun, too. Um, and um, Mirror is a good game as well, because Mirror is a chance to use their face in expressions, especially on Zoom, right? Because there's not a whole lot of body to follow. And mm -hmm. again, some people are in walkers or wheelchairs, so we basically do a lot of these sitting. And Mirror really helps people to feel that they're being seen as okay. well as seeing. Uh, the leader and follower roles are very interesting in terms of therapeutic intervention, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and also the three changes. Have you, You've played three changes probably, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Then we, then we go up and we do two more changes. So it's five changes, right? <laughs> And of course the gibberish, and they and they they love gibberish. Um, I found that when we would do gibberish translator with just one person um, between two people and translating, sometimes the person that would be translating in English was trying to make a lot of jokes and be funny. And the way I try to teach gibberish, excuse me, <clears throat> is that. The person tries to think in English, but speak in gibberish. I'm assuming your audience knows what gibberish is. You mean just kind of uh, talking, just like making noises as if the, as if you're speaking something. Right. So, for example, if I went, "Mom, what's gonna be a gibba, Sarah? Yeah, be gibba ba." You might. So I'm using a lot of syllables, a lot of consonants. And I was actually trying to ask you to take a glass of water from me, but I guess you're not thirsty. So, um, okay. <laughs> and, but we can do things in gibberish with our voice and our tone and as if we're asking questions or making statements. So um, gibberish is a whole wonderful thing to study. And it's a big part of the improv I teach with everybody. And it came from Viola Spolin, who is considered kind of, you know, the mother of improv over here. And uh, so gibberish could be anything I could, but we try to think in English, but speak nonsensical syllables. Mm -hmm. So if I went to, to like this to you, um, Sarah, bush gonna ba 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 Oh. Thank you. You understood me. I was asking <laughs> you to take your glasses off. And that's an example of gibberish where we're thinking it. And you did very well. That was great. And so we're thinking in English, but speaking in gibberish. Um, and that's really good because, you know, when people are finding difficulty to find a word, Mm. gibberish yeah you don't actually need the word do you no and it's no. also a way of communicating with others in a unique way and it actually with the couples that are in the classes it improves their communication outside of class as well mm. it's, it's a fun way to play a game so those are some of the things we do and, and you said you said that sometimes somebody else narrates that did you say so you're, you're combining the gibberish game yes. with yes. Um, yes. with the dubbing when yes. when you have one person making the actions and one person speaking for them right. so for example we might have two players and the scene is a fresh vegetable market and we assign the who you know in improv we talked about the who the what and the where we assign the um who to a a person who's selling vegetables at the market and a customer and the the uh where is a fresh market a farmer's mm -hmm. market and we haven't quite decided on the what in this scene and so two people will be talking to each other they're both speaking gibberish and one person mm -hmm. uh is speaking in an english translation so person a would go and their translator would say please buy my melons and person b might say oh be lucky no i came here for grapefruit but <laughs> what i love to do is i like to put the uh, a masculine deep sounding voice behind the woman so the woman's a different kind of voice 
and um <laughs> it's just delightful and one of their favorite games believe it or not we play gibberish opera we come up with a name of the song <laughs> and um you know if i thought of it i would have had some tracks lined up for you because they've signed waivers to show their um images and so we'll we'll, we'll decide on the name of a silly opera like the fish that were made out of straw in in italy or something and then two different people will be the singers and two different people who will be off screen are the translators and it's <laughs> so much fun and people yeah, so it's, really, cool. it's really fun yeah that is fantastic because dubbing is one of my favorite games and i just love that idea of the of like a, a translator dubbing. yes yes <laughs> and dubbing, like in foreign film we do an exercise called foreign film in my other classes where you're dubbing i think oh that's brilliant and and someone from um so from white white be happy which is a organization over on the isle of Wight um in england here and and they, there's a comment there just saying i like the idea of communicating in gibberish i do too i really i think that that's really um it's a really profound idea actually in that you know people can build that confidence in doing something that they might otherwise be embarrassed about you know because people who have communication difficulties will often find themselves speaking odd the, you know, odd sounds or the wrong word. Um, and it could be quite embarrassing for people. It can be quite sensitive and difficult. So to kind of flip that round and say, well, actually, now we're going to do it on purpose and we're going to have fun with it. And, and, and I think that potentially, it has potential to change the whole dynamic Absolutely. of the problem. Absolutely. You know, these games were devised by Viola Spolin and Neva Boyd at Hull House which was America, the birth of American social work in this country. And um, actually Jane Addams, who won Nobel Peace Prizes, founded Hull House, but she had visited Europe and the UK, Britain, to see how things were being done for social welfare back there, back then, because it was the early 1900s. And the gibberish game, the, the, the people who got services were the immigrant, basically the women and children of the European immigrants and other countries that were coming into Europe, to um, Chicago and building the buildings in the oh. 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. Yes. And so they couldn't understand each other. You might have a child that was from Poland and another child that was from Greece. And so these games taught them how to communicate with, with each other, <laughs> especially when they used intention and uh movement to express what they were feeling so there was a real purpose behind this yeah oh that's fascinating yeah oh, it's so cool to hear the um the background of it and sort of how yeah. how that idea developed and yeah oh you're a wealth of knowledge margot <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i enjoy it and as a social worker myself Jane Addams is considered the mother of social work with Hull House. And Neva Boyd is considered the mother of recreational therapy in this country. And she devised all kinds of play games and developed parks and recreation. And then Viola Spolin is the mother of improv. So all of my interests combine together at Hull House. And I just find mm -hmm. it, um, I just find it exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I just enjoyed this so much. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's so great to to just be able to talk about you know the amazing work that you're doing, that the games, the history, the the benefits to people, um, and it it's really insightful. Actually, it's really um, yeah, it's it's really inspiring. Um, just makes me think, you know, what what more can we do? Like, the, there's there's so much richness in this. What's next? Yeah. What's next? <laughs> I I love your podcast. I love the art and the music. It's so beautifully put together. Congratulations on that. It's Thank lovely. You. Thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome back anytime for um, for another chat. It would be really cool to have you again. Definitely keep us updated on what you're doing, and um, and I'll. And I'll share um, I'll share your your courses when 
once you're back up and you're you're in it all and you've got it all ready so definitely let me know and i will put it out on our socials great thank you all right and you yeah. as well thank you thanks so we'll leave we'll um we'll let everyone get their dinner now uh, if you're in the uk or lunch if you're in the states <laughs> breakfast if you're in australia who knows <laughs> So uh yeah we'll we'll um we'll say goodbye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks for watching. Get my little graphics up. Sorry, I'm a bit late. <laughs> Let's say goodbye again. Bye. <laughs>